faccio entrare un po' di gente o no, vabbè, non aspettiamo. Allora, quindi appunto i microfoni sono questi okay. due, quindi vuoi questo... non stare troppo lontana. Ah, ok. Eh, con questo vai avanti e indietro. Avanti e indietro. E se lo tieni premuto. Ah, posso vai, puntare. Uh, ah, comincia adesso? No, oh, devo... Sì, sì, ma dico, non deve entrare più. Oh, vabbè, ok, non uguale. Ok, we can start the gong show session. So let me remind you, uh, each speaker has uh, 10 minutes, including questions. So whether there can be questions or not depends on the speaker. And uh, yeah, 10 all included. So. And uh, okay, that's it. So we start with uh, Marina Moletti, please. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. First of all, I thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity of uh, presenting my work, which is done in collaboration uh, uh, with Roberto Valandro and Andres Colinucci. So today I will talk about Calabiao trifold plops uh, obtained as quiver varieties from monopole deformations. So the starting point is uh, type 2A string theory on trivially fiber daily surfaces. That is type 2A string theory on a background geometry that is given by uh, flat space time cr uh, times uh, NAD or before singularity of type G, uh, where G uh, takes, uh, is uh, one of the AD families. Okay. So, uh, since, uh, so the complex deformations uh, of, the eight, uh, of the X2 surface, so of the LED singularities, are encoded in the background profile of a complex, uh, of a complex scalar field that uh, transforms in the adjoint of the Lie algebra G, which belongs to the six-dimensional effective field theory that develops at the singularity. And what we want to do is to consider background profiles for this phi field that depend on, the coordinate, on a coordinate W that parameterizes a complex, a complex plane transverse to the AD singularity. So to generate uh, uh, a, threefold, uh, a, um, a threefold geometry that is basically a vibration, a vibration over C uh, of a, a family of deformed AD singularities. And notably, the resolution pattern of X3 is uh, completely specified by the profile that we assign to phi. So uh, what we ask is, uh, so uh, our aim is basically to recover the structure of the geometry X3 uh, from the moduli space of a D-brain probe, which in our case will be a D2 brain. And uh, since the world volume EFT of D2 that probes an AD singularity is known, is known to be an unequal for supersymmetric 3D theory uh, with uh, a quiver that is nothing but the thinking, a, fine, uh, a fine thinking quiver of the, dunk, uh, a fine thinking diagram, sorry, of the Lie algebra. We show that it is possible to uh, obtain uh, so, uh, a an effective description uh, of a D2, uh, of the theory on a D2 that probes the geometry, uh, the trifold geometry X3, by adding uh, to uh, the, the theory on the, uh, on the trivial vibration an unequal to preserving deformation that affects the superpotential of the originally unequal for supersymmetric theory. So the structure uh, of this deformation uh, is schematically represented by a trace of a product uh, of two matrices. Uh, the first one, phi, uh, is uh, nothing but the profile uh, of the phi field that we have introduced in the beginning, now expressed in terms uh, of the chirals uh, of the vector multiplets in the theory, uh, times a G moment map that repackages the Coulomb branch data of the theory. So both uh, local data like uh, the Coulomb branch chirals and uh, non-local excitation like uh, monopole operators. So once we integrate out the massive degrees of freedom, we obtain an effective theory and an effective superpotential whose have terms reproduce the defining equation in C4 of the geometry that we wanted to probe. So it must be mentioned that uh, analogous results have, be, uh, have been obtained in the past, but uh, though with completely different approaches by Witten and Klebanov for the Conifold case, or, and by Cacciazzo, Wafa, and Katz, or uh, Gubser, Nekrasov, and Shatashvili. 
So uh, an example uh, is a, an example of a simple flop geometry, which is our basically our focus. Uh, so that is a geometry where you can only uh, um, blow up a single P1, uh, a single P1. is a uh, non-trivial vibration, basically a monodropic vibration of an A3 singularity over C, uh, which from the point of view of the D2 brain is obtained by deforming the theory of an A3 uh, and the deformation, uh, um, as, we, as you can see, uh, involves only the degrees of freedom of the last leftmost and, right no, and rightmost nodes. And in particular, the, the formation involves the, the monopole operators associated to, this, uh, uh, to the two nodes, uh, which are treated, can be treated uh, according to a technique that has been uh, uh, discussed in the literature. So to obtain an effective theory in the IR that uh, is characterized by a, a conifold shaped quiver uh, with fields that are that corresponds to the invariant uh, uh, to the invariants under the two nodes that have been integrated out and the effective potential uh, of, that we obtain uh, it, uh, gives access uh, to uh, an equation that precisely re, uh, reproduces the defining equation of the geometry in terms uh, of the uh, coulomb branch invariant uh, of the gauge invariance of the theory so uh, another, exam another relevant example, uh, of, uh, in this case of flop of length two, is a brown wimps trifold, which is a non-trivial vibration of the form D4 uh, surfaces uh, uh, over C, uh, de described by this equation. And this is uh, analogously obtained by turning on some de uh, monopole deformation for the uh, three non-exceptional nodes. And this, uh, after integrating out all the massive excitations, gives rise to an effective theory described by uh, this quiver, uh, where the only degrees of freedom appearing are, again, uh, invariants uh, under the gauge groups associated to these nodes, to the red nodes. And the effective superpotential that we have not written, uh, fully written here, uh, reproduces uh, the, the singularity. Uh, that we wanted to describe. So uh, to conclude, uh, we uh, basically what we do is to provide a simple recipe to extract the n equal to superpotential over a large class of non-torical abio trifolds. We propose a physical explanation for a non-commutative uh, geometry uh, algorithm that derives the quiver and the relief from the non-affine uh, and the affine linking diagram of the starting ADE algebra. And our final aim is to uh, apply our technique to simple flops of any length, that is also E6, E7, and E8 families. Thanks for your attention. Thanks, Marina. Any okay. question or comments? Yes. Um, the black hole that you uh, worked on, uh, which mechanism such a black hole comes from? We know, uh, is it the uh, same as the gravitational collapse black hole? Sorry, I, I don't, uh, I, I cannot hear. Black hole that you mentioned. <laughs> the black hole? That comes from the uh, potential uh, that you have shown. I'm not, uh, I'm not talking about black hole, okay. sorry. Okay, <laughs> thank you, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Any other questions? Okay, if not, let's thank Marina again. Next speaker, which, um, yes, thanks. Okay, the next speaker is uh, Kuyan Yu Hao. Please go ahead. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak here. And I also want to thank the organizers. Uh, so I'm going to describe a joint work in progress with Andy Nitsky on the abelianization of Verasaro conformal blocks at C equals one. 
Uh, so as we are familiar with, the Verasaro blocks are the building blocks of the 2D CFTs. They are solutions to the word identities. Um, so um, in this talk, I will only focus on the chiral part. And for simplicities, I will mainly focus on the Riemann surfaces without punctures. Uh, let me first give a quick review of the definition. So a Verasaro block is a system of correlation functions where the insertions are the stress energy tensor. Uh, so the insertion number can be arbitrary in a negative integer. Uh, we require that the correlators should be holomorphic away from the diagonal, which I mean PI equals PJ. And uh, at the diagonal, the singularity structure should be controlled by the TTOPE. Uh, and as usual, under the change of coordinates, T should transform in this particular way. Uh, so Verasaro blocks are very important and interesting, but they are also hard to compute. Uh, and the main goal of my talk today is to describe a new way to construct the Verasaro conformal blocks at the particular central charge C equals one. Um, so to be more specific, what we do is to construct a abelianization map, uh, this FW, and here this conf means the space of conformal blocks. So FW is a map from the space of Heisenberg conformal blocks over C tilde to the space of Verasaro blocks over C. Um, so this subscription W uh, means a spectral network, which is originally defined in the work by JMN. And actually, the main new idea in our paper uh, is to uh, use the spectral network in this nonabilianization construction. And we should understand that uh, the nonabilianization map is to simplify the computation of the more complicated Verasaro blocks uh, to the uh, calculations of the abelian objects, the Heisenberg blocks. And we call it uh, abelian because, uh, first of all, naively, uh, the Heisenberg algebra has another name, which is this fn u1 uh, vertex algebra. And also, we know that the Heisenberg algebra is the vertex algebra behind the free boson theory. So in that sense, it's much simpler. Uh, and to construct this nonabilianization map, we will need to require that this Riemann uh, surface, the tilde for the Heisenberg side, uh, to be a branched double cover of the Riemann surface C. And here is how it's going to be uh, uh, presented. So on the base, we have a curve representing the Riemann surface C. And uh, on the top, the two curves are the two sheets of C tilde. Uh, because it is branched, so we will have a branch point which is denoted by the orange cross, and it corresponds to where the two sheets of uh, C tilde collide. Um, so now let me start constructing this nonabilianization map. Uh, so in the definition, we said that uh, those correlators should have uh, insertions, which are the generator of the vertex algebra. So I should first tell you a dictionary for the generators. And here's what we do. So if we want to insert a TP on the base, uh, we will need to use uh, both of the insertions of J, which is the generator of the Heisenberg algebra, uh, at the two pre-images. And we need to take this uh, particular combination of the terms. We can check that by this dictionary, we can indeed get the correct uh, OPE if we are away from the branch point. Uh, but now you might have a question, which is it seems that using this dictionary, we could have already written down some uh, nonabilianization map. Why do we even need to use the spectral network? The reason is that if we use this um, dictionary directly without any spectral network, the image of this uh, naive nonabilianization map will, will not be the space of Verasaro conformal blocks over C. There will be some unwanted insertions where there is a primary field with a uh, weight one over 16 at each branch point. Um, so, but this map is not we, what we want. We don't want these extra insertions. We still want a map to the uh, space of vacuum Verasaro blocks. And actually, the main new idea in our work is to use spectral network to cancel those extra singularities at the branch points. Uh, and here, let me uh, remind you quickly what is a spectral network. So uh, for, for the purpose of this talk, we can simply understand it as a union of contours, which are those GIs, and they come with a label IJ, which denotes the two sheets of C tilde. 
Uh, and we require that at each branch point, there will be three contours ending at it at an angle two pi over three. And what I mean by using the spectral network is that we are inserting an operator EW, which I will show on the next slide, into the Heisenberg correlators in this non map. So if we want to have the trivial insertion, uh, the trivial insertion on the Verasaro side, uh, on the Heisenberg side, instead of just inserting one, we should insert this EW. And if we have, want to have the one point function, instead of just using the dictionary, we uh, also need to remember inserting EW. And this also works for the uh, other endpoint uh, correlators. Okay, so uh, now I want to give you the definition of this operator EW, which is essential. So it is given by the exponential of one over two pi i times uh, the integral, uh, where the integral contour is given by the spectral network. And although this integral is on the base, uh, the two insertions, this side plus, side minus, are actually on the cover, uh, depending on the label. Uh, and here, uh, side plus minus are uh, the free fermions which appear in the fermionization of the Heisenberg fields. Um, so uh, those are the uh, basic ingredients of our non story. And uh, uh, we know that there are different types of spectral networks. Uh, for each spectral network, uh, applying our non-abelianization map, we will arrive at a type of the Verasaro uh, blocks. In particular, there is a, a, a type of uh, Verasaro, uh, the, there is a type of spectral network known as the fentrue nielsen type, which is adapted to the pan's decomposition. If we use this particular spectral network and apply the non-abelianization map, we expect that uh, the corresponding type of uh, Verasaro blocks will be the ones that by AJT correspondence uh, that are identified with the Nikolsov partition functions. And here is an example on, on the five punctured sphere. Uh, so here those black curves are the spectral networks and we can see that it's indeed adapted um, with the uh, pan's decomposition. And it will, uh, we expect that it will give us the uh, Nikolsov partition function corresponding to this cone diagram. We can already see that there are some similarities uh, between the two plots. Um, so that's all I want to say about our story. Uh, and now I just want to mention some generalizations. The first one uh, is a natural one, which is to study the WN uh, conformal blocks at C equals N minus one. And there, the conformal blocks are less studied, so it will be interesting to get some results. Uh, and the second one is to generalize the central charge to the cases where C is uh, not equal to one. And uh, that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. There is time for one question, yes. Uh, in, in my work with Okunkov, 2003, we constructed the free fermion representation of these partition functions. Uh, so it uses uh, vertex operators from GL infinity. So you can realize them on a single fermion, but it's not the most natural operator. Have you looked at those? Are they equivalent or it's, or it's something else? Uh, the curve which you're using looks like a speckled curve, like a zabrick witten curve. So it, so it should correspond to a, some asymptotic limit what conformal dimensions are sent to infinity. So it might be an asymptotic expansion, not, not the actual conversion. Uh, sorry, I'm not uh, very familiar with this. Okay, so let's thank the speaker again. Next speaker, here it is. Okay, so the next speaker is uh, Sagar Husseini. Please go ahead. Thank you for the opportunity and uh, for organizing this nice conference. I would like to tell you about topological uh, symmet sorry, uh, symmetry topological filters and how to obtain them from a string theory. 
So this is based on work done together with Iñaki Garcia Xaberio and also work in progress with Yuji Tachika Van Housen. Okay, so what are these uh, symmetry topological field theories? Uh, well, before I say that, uh, let's recall that in modern physics, we would like to think of symmetries in terms of topological operators and uh, their fusion rules as categorical structures, as we heard in the talks by Sakura and Matthew. So now consider a quantum field theory which has a fixed local structure, so fixed spectrum of local operators and their correlation functions. Then this given QFT, uh, it may admit different choices of global structures or symmetries. And it, we believe that this, uh, this topological data of symmetries and the choices of symmetries, they can be encoded in a QFT in, one, in a topological filter in one dimension higher, which is called a symmetry TFT. This is much like the idea of anomaly theory. So we have that uh, the anomalies of a D-dimensional theory are, um, described by a D plus one dimensional anomaly theory. But there's a crucial difference that here, the symmetry TFT is dynamical and it is a non-invertible theory. So uh, it's Hilbert space has dimension greater than one and um, and so the, the theory on the boundary, um, it's, um, it has a partition vector and a partition function and there is this gap boundary on this side where um, if you assume that the elements of the Hilbert space in this story are in one to one correspondence with the boundary conditions here, it is only when we fix the boundary condition and pick a space in the Hilbert space that we fix the boundary theory to have a partition function. And in doing so, by pick, picking a boundary condition, we fix this uh, theory on the boundary to have a fixed global structure. So it becomes an absolute theory and uh, it's no longer defined relative to this symmetry TFT. Now, uh, once we do that, we get this, uh, once we fix the boundary condition, we get the, fi the theory on the boundary with the fixed global structure and its anomaly theory. Okay, um, now, how do we uh, actually get this symmetry TFT from a string theory? Well, we can consider any construction you like, ADS TFT or uh, some brain construction, but let's focus on uh, geometric engineering where we have just pure geometry. We put a string theory on some product manifold CL uh, times MD, and a CL here is the internal space. It uh, has the is as the form uh, of a cone over some space L, some base L, and uh, it is non-compact, so it extends to infinity on this side. And then, in this way, we can engineer a quantum filter on MD living at this singular locus of this internal space. So this quantum filter we construct, it, it, uh, it is the relative QF, QFT that uh, I mentioned. It, we, we need to figure out what global structures we have. Uh, how do we do this from a string theory? Um, so what, it turns out that the, the, top, the information about the symmetry TFT, it comes from the topology of the boundary L. So if we, instead of reducing a string theory on uh, CL, if we reduce it on L, um, we find the D plus one dimensional theory, which is exactly this symmetry TFT. Um, so if we look at this picture and then we try to do dimensional reduction on L, we get this boundary at infinity gives us this boundary that we had before in the symmetry TFT picture. And then uh, we said that the QFT lives here. And then on this side, we have the boundary where uh, the relative QFT leaves, and then in this way we can recover the picture of the symmetry TFT from a string theory. So very good. Now, how do we actually um, calculate this symmetry TFT um, more precisely? So can we write an action for it? Uh, let's focus on uh, type 2B string theory, or type 2 string theory. Here we know that the, uh, the R fields combine into a self-dual field, which is valued in a uh, twisted differential K theory. And, and it is well known that it's hard to, so I want to get an action for the symmetry TFT by dimensional reduction of an action for string theory. But we know that it's hard to write an action for self-dual fields. Um, at least in 10 dimension, I don't think there is a well-known action written in terms of twisted differential K theory. So uh, how do we deal with this? What we can do is, uh, looking at these papers, we can construct some 11 dimensional actions. So we go from 10 dimension to one dimension higher and construct a chern simon theory, which realizes this self-told field as a boundary mode. And uh, so 
we have this element of chance symmetry on the manifold with boundary and the gauge degrees of freedom on the boundary, they give us the, uh, the self-dual field. Now, um, then now, now that we have a good description for this uh, self-dual field, if we reduce this chance symmetry, we expect to find the symmetry TFT. So in picture, again, we started from a string theory um, on y times L, I said that L is the boundary geometry, and then when we reduce, we get a d pl plus one dimensional theory on Y. And uh, this is where the symmetry TFD lives. Now, uh, since we cannot write a, an action in 10D on Y times L, we go extend this Y to Z. When we write an action, uh, a chern Simon action on Y, on Z times L, and then we integrate over L to find a theory on Z, then the gauge degrees of freedom of Z give us the boundary theory on Y. Uh, now, in equation more precisely, we have that uh, we want to work locally because otherwise we run, the, we run into the problem of having boundaries of boundaries. So um, we write the Lagrangian density and for the chain assignment here, and then we integrate over L, uh, and then looking at the gauge transformation of this, uh, we find the, the derivative of the symmetry TFT. Okay, so now there are some remaining problems related to some well-known problems. So the, con the, con the configuration we considered was type two string theory and uh, in, in this generalized composition where we have h 2 set k theory, um, the NS field is taken to be a background field and not dynamical. How do we extend to the case when that is not the case? And also how do we, ca we extend to the case of M theory? Uh, can be write a two of dimensional action which describes it in the same way. And also, at the beginning I said that we want to think of symmetries as categories, uh, so can we extract this categorical information in this construction? Because um, the symmetry TFT we actually get from the dimensional redu reduction of the action, it contains a BF theory which tells us about the choices of higher form symmetries and also anomalies of higher form symmetries. Uh, so how do we see the categorical information there? Um, but there is some work in progress, but uh, much needs to be worked out. And finally, we know brains, uh, they, they, they can be total as categories, so can we find a way to extract some information about categorical symmetries from that? Okay, thank you for listening. Yes, a question there? Yeah. <laughs> I'm confused by your question, how do we extend to M theory? Because first of all, it's easier to push forward in differential cohomology than in differential KO. And secondly, I thought that's what you did in your paper. Yeah, so in M theory, there is a topological action. Uh, there is the G4, G4, C3, and extending that to uh, 12 dimension, we want to think of G4 as a gauge transformation of a B5 field, which is a theory in, in 11, in 12 dimensions. And that's, it's hard to, we cannot quite write B5 cubed because the dimensions don't quite work. I, I thought you took the differential version of CGG in your paper and pushed forward yeah, in that, differential uh, cohomology. Yeah, yeah, in that paper we, um, this is a, it's a different paper. So here we want to just look at the, the gauge transformations of a chern symmetry in one degree higher, which is the, I see. Yeah. Okay. Any more urgent question? Okay, if not, let's thank the speaker, speaker again. Okay, the next speaker is Edward Mazeng. Please, go ahead. Well, thank you very much for the organizers for letting me speak a bit about some work I've been doing with uh, Matthias Gabirdiel and Rajesh Gopakumar. Um, so I want to start with going back to quite an old idea due to Tuft, which is basically the question as to how large end gauge theories are sort of secretly string theories. And sort of his insight was that he identified the large end expansion with some sort of topological expansion of sum over 2D surfaces uh, in the dual string theory. And the idea was that if you looked at the Feynman diagrams, uh, you would basically kind of think of them if you squint enough as some sort of 2D surfaces on the right-hand side. So making this idea precise is quite difficult, and to make some progress on that, what we're gonna be doing today 
is if you want to erase all the sort of spatial dependence uh, on uh, the propagators of the theory, set the propagators to one if you want. So we're gonna be looking at gauge theories that are just simply matrix integrals. So here is what I would call maybe the simplest possible gauge theory. So this is just the Gaussian matrix integral. This is an integral over uh, n squared iid random variables. And what I wanna convince you today is that somehow there's a whole string theory looking into it. So what would be the gauge invariant observables of this theory? They would be expectation values of products of traces. And we can compute them just by simple Wick contractions. So um, I'm showing you here, for example, a four point function of trace of m squared and we would diagrammatically keep track of this from a Feynman diagram by having these four external vertices. They have two, uh, two legs coming out because it's trace of m squared, and the various edges are just the wick contractions that I'm showing here on the left. So I wanna follow this Feynman diagram today and try to show you how this Feynman diagram, first of all, map it to some 2D surface explicitly, and then tell you how that 2D surface is embedded in some target space. So, uh, let me first of all just, of course, state the result. So this is really a result a la tuft. Um, this is an explicit all to all orders in one over n matching of the correlators of the Gaussian matrix model with endpoint functions of a dual closed string theory. And I'll tell you what those, that string theory is and I'll tell you what these vertex operators are. So this is really along with the idea of tuft where the string coupling is just one over n. So uh, I'll make two comments very briefly. First of all, I just want to emphasize that uh, there's been, of course, a, an idea since the 90s as to how the Feynman diagrams of the theory were related to these 2D surfaces. And the picture there was essentially that the Feynman diagrams, or their dual really, were some sort of discretization of the surface. And to get a genuine string theory, you needed to take some sort of continuum limit where the mesh, sort of the discretization size goes to zero. And on the, on the matrix model side, that was what was known as the double scaling limit. So if you want the whole point of today's talk is to try to understand how we're gonna step back away from this double scaling limit. And the main reason why is because in most other examples of gauge string duality that we have, we don't resort to this double scaling limit. So what we wanna understand is some sort of new picture as to how the Feynman diagrams are realizing these 2D surfaces. We're certainly not the first people to step away from this double scaling limit, so there was a lot of beautiful work in the early 2000s uh, by Dijkraaf and Waffe, who showed in fact that the type of matrix integrals we're talking about today could descend actually from some beautiful system of uh, brains and topological string theory. The focus here today is trying to reconstruct, if you want, the world sheet theory and sort of fleshing that duality out by adding in an operator dictionary so that every time you say put in trace of m to the k in this matrix integral, you know what vertex operator to plug into the sum over 2D surfaces of the string theory path integral. So, uh, what is it that kind of replaces the minimal string, if you want, away from the double scaling limit? It turns out we're lucky that there's three equivalent descriptions. So, uh, of course, I only have time to talk just about one of them, so we'll focus the one on the left here, this A model. Um, but the fact that these three are equivalent is something that goes back to the 90s, some work by Goshal and Waffa, and Muki and Waffa in particular. The one that I'll be talking about today is the one that sort of naturally arises from this picture of the Feynman diagrams, and it's essentially a topologically A model twisted uh, Wessumino Witten model with target SL2R mod U1 at this very special level one. And in particular, what I'm showing you here is some sort of uh, kind of operator dictionary, if you want, that's telling you how to relate the vertex operators here to traces in this Gaussian matrix model. So in the remaining couple minutes, what I want to do is to try to motivate sort of why is it that we're falling on those particular string theories? Why are those the ones that are coming out from the Feynman diagrams? And we'll look in particular at the A model. So the A model, just as a quick recap, is a sum of holomorphic maps from some world sheet to the target space. So what I need to do to tell you is how the Feynman diagrams reconstruct the world sheet and how the Feynman diagrams know about this holomorphic map, okay? So those are the remaining two slides. So we need a different picture than discretization, and what we're gonna use is what's known as uh, the, the Strabel parametrization of the moduli space of Riemann surfaces. And this goes back to the work of Strabel and was sort of famously used by Konzevich in his proof of the Witten conjecture. And uh, what it is is an exact equivalence between metrized ribbon graphs, ribbon graphs are just these matrix Feynman diagrams, and points on the moduli space. So, and the way that this works roughly uh, oops, sorry. Um, I won't really have time to tell you, but uh, I'll try to distill this down to four lessons. So there is this graph, which the Strabel graph, and that's the, these yellow lines over here. 
And I've tried to superimpose this Strabel graph directly on the world sheet that you see. So we're looking at some four-point function in the matrix model. This is going to be some four-point function on the, uh, on the dual string theory. The Strabel graph is, how is it related to our Feynman diagrams? It turns out to be the dual to the Feynman diagrams. Now, if you want to specify exactly which 2D surface I'm talking about, sort of what are the coordinates on moduli space, those turn out to be certain lengths that I assign to every edge of the Feynman diagram. I assign some positive numbers. Those are like the coordinates on moduli space. So I need to assign some, some lengths to these yellow lines. And how do I do that? Well, this is a bit of an art, but sort of the choice that we take is to uh, say that it's the number of wick contractions that these yellow lines are crossing, okay? So in particular, here these yellow lines cross the white lines of the original Feynman diagram once, so you would assign length one to all of them. So in particular, if you want the coordinates on moduli space are all integer, okay? So maybe the way to phrase this is that we're not really discretizing the world sheet, but in some sense, lattice-izing directly the moduli space here. Now, if you want to each sort of, if there's one thing to take away from today, it's to think of every single gauge theory Feynman diagram as one particular world sheet. That's kind of the underlying picture that we have. So in the remaining minute, I just want to emphasize, not only now have we kind of taken the Feynman diagram and told you what 2D surface we're talking about, but I now want to embed this 2D surface into the target space. So for us, the target space here is just gonna be a sphere, which I've very suggestively drawn just as this line of a CP1, okay? And the world sheet, if you want, it's gonna wrap this sphere multiple times, twice as many times as there are edges to the Feynman diagrams. So what you see in these colored lines, this is just some covering of the Riemann sphere, eight times because there's four edges to this Feynman diagram. And these are very particular types of maps. They're branched holomorphic coverings of the sphere branched over exactly three points. Um, and if you want the whole way to specify this map, it reduces down to just specifying the branching profile over those three points. And it turns out that these diagrams actually know everything you need to know to specify that branching. So roughly, there's a sort of, uh, it's a bit of a black magic if you want, but uh, sort of the vertices, edges, and faces encode the branching profile of this map over those three points. And it turns out you can't take every Riemann surface and wrap the sphere in this particular way. Which ones are the ones that you can do? It's exactly those that were labeled by these integer points. This is a beautiful theorem due to Belli. So how is it that this is picking out this particular string theory uh, that I suggested was the dual? Well, it was shown earlier in the symmetric orbifold case that this SL2R string theory at this very special level one localizes exactly to holomorphic covering maps of the sphere. So in that sense, it's a very satisfying story. So I'll stop with that. And uh, if you want a more humanely paced version of this talk, uh, you can scan this QR code. So then I'll take some questions. Thank you. Any question or comments? Yes, uh, Andres Cap. Yes. Thank you. That was a really nice talk. Thank um, you. Could you somehow? Is there an intuition as to why the number of edges g gives you the degree of the uh, map or whatever? Right. Right. Um, well, roughly every edge of these, uh, the way that you can sort of write down this map is every single edge. Uh, well, half of the edge wraps the target space sphere once. That's why the degree of the cover is twice as many times at the edge. And we're thinking of every single half edge as really an open string world sheet. That's, a, that's the strip. So if you want, it's gluing all these open string world sheets to form the closed string world sheet, and every open string is wrapping the sphere exactly once. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. There's one more question. Thanks for a nice talk. Uh, so usually we, in string theory, we have two sides. Uh, the side that you have the matrix model is also realized with brains. And in that context, the string worksheet itself gives you the corresponding diagrams of a tooth automatically, right? So we don't have to kind of reconstruct it. It's there. In some sense, uh, string field theory is the analog of writing those diagrams in the field theory language. So you're going kind of one step further. But if you directly at the level of string itself, it's more direct, I would think. Yes, so uh, what I would say is that the Feynman diagram here itself, uh, actually you can think of, uh, so the, the Strabel construction really is implementing the sort of same gluing of open string strips as you do in string field theory. Um, the, what we would try to do is to understand how this is dual to a closed string world sheet. So that, that is maybe the, 
Yeah, but the open string part, I, mean, I would think that the first step is to go to the realize it in the open string setup. Yes. And then just say why open became closed in the string language itself. Yeah, yeah, so yes, this is yes. all about sort of that open closed duality here. I, I agree, definitely. Thank you. Okay, thank you. There's no time for more questions, I'm sorry. Uh, so let's thank the speaker again. So the last speaker before the break, here it is. So now the next speaker is uh, Vatsal, please go ahead. Hi everyone, uh, I'll talk about uh, my work with Shiraz, Shobarnon and Nikhil. Uh, this work is on fermionic chern simons theory and part of it was uh, published as a preprint last year and part of it is uh, still in process. Uh, my objective with today's talk will be to look at a fully non-perturbative finite temperature solution to a non-supersymmetric non-abelian gauge theory with vector fermions in curved space. Uh, our interest in this theory is for its demonstrated Bose-Fermi duality, uh, wherein there, uh, the thermal free energy spectrum of a bosonic theory matches with that of the fermionic theory under an explicit map in the couplings of the two theories. These calculations were performed uh, in the light cone gauge over the past 13 years and uh, for that reason, uh, this hasn't been worked out in uh, any other uh, non-trivial manifold. Last year, we were able to reproduce these fermionic results uh, in flat space uh, using the quote-unquote temporal gauge, which I'll describe soon. Uh, uh, the way we set it up uh, was uh, amenable to generalizations to general genus G Riemannian manifolds, and uh, I'll uh, show you how. The motivation of this entire enterprise is to establish the Bose-Fermi duality on general genus G Riemann manifolds, possibly at finite end. Uh, it has been conjectured that uh, this should hold, uh, but it would be nice to see a few examples. Uh, the theory that I'll work with has a gauge group of UN. Um, the action is given by the well-known 3D Chern-Simons action, minimally coupled to vector matter, fermionic matter. And since I'm interested in the thermal theory, uh, the time coordinate is compactified. Uh, the quote-unquote uh, temporal gauge that we adopt is this partial 3, A3 equal to 0, 3 being the temporal direction. Uh, I will not go, go into the details of the entire gauge fixing, but I would like your attention uh, at the fact uh, that our gauge fixing pre prescription uh, is valid for all genus G, uh, equation 4 particularly. So before we, uh, before we choose a particular genus and work out a particular example, uh, let me impress upon you this uh, expression 5 and 6, which is general for any manifold for at finite n and at finite volume, which means that uh, we have a prescription in principle to work out the fermionic uh, matter chern simons theory uh, on, any, on any manifold. Um, it is a complicated mess, but you, uh, you must appreciate the fact that all of the terms here in this action are completely local. So there is still hope that we might be able to evaluate it uh, in particular cases. Uh, so we set upon uh, the simplest case, which is genus zero, S2, and uh, uh, we, look at the, we look at the action. Uh, it's still not that simple, but we can uh, do a further simplification, which comes at large n. Uh, we, uh, we are not able to solve it at finite n, which uh, st still remains a challenge. But, but at large n, what happens is that we are only, uh, and after we perform the, uh, the path integrals over the spatial gauge fields, uh, the, the temporal gauge field, A3, uh, is, field, uh, is space independent, which means that the path integral is only left over the fermions. And uh, the path integral over the gauge field, A3, uh, turns into a regular integral over the holonomy eigenvalues, lambdas. So uh, this, uh, uh, there's one caveat here. The covariant derivative, d tilde, that you see, uh, is a highly non-trivial object. Uh, since we, it, we have to evaluate it on the surface of the sphere, uh, it will also depend on the spin connections of S2. Now, uh, to, solve for, to solve for this theory, we need to find the eigenvectors of this, uh, uh, of this operator, and those eigenvectors have to be uh, 
figured out in terms of uh, spin weighted monopole spherical harmonics. Once we do that, we can find out, uh, it's, a, it's a long exercise which I can't flash here, uh, but at the end of the exercise, we'll have this finite temperature gap equation for the self energy, sigma, sigma of t, uh, and remarkably, the, the, uh, so the gap equation for the finite radius case, equation 12, looks uh, quite similar to the gap equation we obtained for the flat space case, which is equation 14. One would say naively that uh, you can obtain equation 12 from 14 by a simple replacement of an integral by a sum, but I would uh, press that uh, this replacement, the details of this replacement lies in the, uh, the entire exercise of uh, uh, using spherical harmonics, monopole spherical harmonics, because we wouldn't know the limits otherwise uh, of the summation for the replacement. We can solve this gap equation exactly, by exact, I mean at every order in the Tehut coupling, uh, but only at finite, uh, at large n. The solutions are given in terms of two functions, omega and phi. Uh, only phi enters anything physical, for example, the mass gap equation, equation 19, or the, the thermal free energy. In the flat space case, we were able to evaluate the thermal uh, the uh, function phi explicitly as in equation 21. However, in the, uh, in the finite radius case, we weren't able to do that. We haven't uh, obtained a closed form solution yet, but we can still numerically compare it with the, uh, with the large radius uh, limit. Two things that we immediately observe here is that the, the thermal mass for, uh, for the finite radius case is lower than the thermal mass for, for, for flat space. And, and the second thing is, if we start with a theory, uh, which uh, if we turn on a bare mass, which is greater, then uh, the two solutions uh, come close to each other, which seems like if we have a larger bare mass, the theory localizes on S2. It becomes closer to the flat space case. Uh, we don't have an analytical understanding of it yet. But it's just preliminary work. Uh, I would uh, reserve most of the discussion for posters uh, and the reception, but uh, I would uh, uh, present to you the key takeaway from here. Uh, in our entire calculation, the, the biggest thing that comes out, uh, the biggest difference from the flat space calculation that comes out, is now that the thermal effective action is not independent of the fluxes, the holonomy eigenvalues will not be quantized. If that won't happen, and if the Bose-Fermi duality has to hold, it has to work in a mathematically different way. Uh, and it would be interesting to understand how will that happen. Uh, do I have time to go with the rest? Sure, sure, thank you. So, uh, also in this calculations, uh, uh, as we saw that the, uh, that the fluxes enter the thermal effective action, particularly they enter the fermionic determinant. And uh, this has quite, uh, quite a few similarities with the with the calculations that we were, uh, we could see in the calculations of superconformal index, uh, as in this paper and many others in the literature. We can also now attack a first principles computation of S matrices, which was so far only been approached in an ad hoc manner. Um, but the final point about uh, duality, we weren't able to compute uh, the thermal free energy for bosons because of this uh, uh, of this difficult phi square a square coupling, since the a wedge a wedge term doesn't go away in our gauge. Uh, however, one way to address this is to repeat the Blau and Thompson exercise uh, for for the bosonic case. Uh, thank you. The, these are some selected references from uh, my talk today. Mo a comprehensive list can be found in the papers. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Okay, if not, let's thank the speaker again. So we reconvene at 4.25 in 23 minutes. <laughs>